When people ask you questions, sometimes there's more going on than just the surface. They're not just asking you a question. There are motives involved. There's a dynamic that takes place between two individuals as they strive to understand what you mean by it. I think we've seen the commercial of Bridgestone Tires where they're going to be kind of on a car treadmill where they're going to get out 80,000 miles and the guy that's sitting in a white coat looks over at the driver who may be on the heavier side of things. He said, first time on a treadmill. And what does the man say? What do you mean? There might be a simple question, yes or no, but that's not the dynamic that's taking place. You don't get that commercial, the, the funny part of that, the amusing part, because it's just wonderful. The guy said, what do you mean by that? He knows, why are you saying that? Why would you think this is my first time on a treadmill? You don't have to say a word. We communicate things. We understand what's going on. When God asks the first man and woman as he deals with, with Adam and Eve, God asked the question, where art thou? You think God didn't know where they were? He's talking to them. God knew exactly where he was, but that's not the point of the question. The point of the question is to get the man to understand what relationship he has now with God and his law. Because we read in verses 7 through 9 or 8 leading up to verse 9, that the first man and woman, when they partook of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, they began to have their eyes opened. They understood that they were naked. They tried to make aprons in order to cover that nakedness. And right after that, we find that when he said, where art thou? And it said, we tried to hide ourselves from thee. We were afraid we were naked. And then God asked him another question. Who told you? that thou art naked. Why would he ask that? Would God doesn't really know. He wants just an answer. No, he wants the man to understand. Because God said, did you partake of that tree? Did you eat of that tree that I commanded you not to eat of? And what we see here is God's reason. What he means by the questions is to get man to understand his relationship with God, not his place, his relationship with God according to law. And we do not understand why he asked the question until we come to that conclusion. That's part of understanding what God communicates through questions. Chapter 4. God asked Cain, where is Abel thy brother? God didn't know. He'll say, the blood of the ground, of your brother's blood, comes up to me right now. He knew exactly where Abel was and what had happened to Abel. Cain killed him. When God asks that question, he's trying to get the man, Cain, to understand, where is he? And Cain responds with another question. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, the ground cries out the blood of your brother. And here is getting a man to understand. God did not need to know where the first man was or where Abel was. He knew that. Man needed to know the relationship with God according to law, his commandments. So this evening, I want to look at a chapter in our New Testament in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Because it's filled with questions. And there are a lot of things taking place. There's a lot of motives in asking those questions. Trying to understand not only what did you ask, but what do you mean in asking that question? And I think it's instructive for us to understand. So we're gaining understanding tonight, Matthew 22, from questions and answers. The Pharisees will ask some. The Sadducees will ask some. Jesus, our Lord, will ask some. What do you mean by the questions? We begin. Because here come the Pharisees, and they ask a question, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? When we look at that statement, we see what 
is building up to really what's going on and asking that question. You'll notice that in verse 16, who was gathered there? Their disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians. I don't think those two would be together on many occasions. Pharisees were separatists and they looked at the household of Herod and people following Herod as the, 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 the government in store. That They weren't following God's law. But they were together on this occasion. That might give you a warning. They're going to ask a question. But it has... You need to understand what the true meaning of it, behind that question. And what they were doing, they set him up for him to be in the dilemma. Notice what they say about him. We know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth and carest not for anyone, for thou regardest not the person of man. Where is he going to go, with Herod or with the Pharisees? That's the question. Pharisees said, no, we're not going to give it to Caesar. We're dedicated to God. The Rodians would be giving things to Caesar. So he has a dilemma. And how does Jesus perceive this? He perceived their wicked. They just asked a question. He perceived their wickedness. You do not understand the meaning of that question and the meaning that we need to gain from this unless you understand the motive that's coming up. Say, you're wicked. That question denotes your wickedness. Why make ye trial of me, ye hypocrites? You really do not want to know the answer. You want me to have to go either way and I will lose followers when I do. That's what you really want. That's really the reason for your question. And Jesus perceived that. When you ask questions, that doesn't make you necessarily wicked. But he understood their motive. So how does he answer it? Take some money. Take your Roman money. He's in charge. See, whose picture is on that money? Caesar. And so Jesus takes it from that, and he says, after they says, it's verse 21, they send him Caesar's on that. Then said they to them, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. The problem was, is that there's things within God's framework of law that allows for Caesar to have his tribute money. It doesn't violate your relationship with God. That's the understanding to walk away from. They didn't understand that. Their motives were not pure. They were wicked. They wanted to get him in a dilemma. But he answers the question. And he says, that's his money. Give it to him. And it opens up our understanding. What's my relationship with civil government? There are a lot of Christians that it's just purely wicked, have nothing to do with it. You do not vote. Why, you don't, why don't you put, not pay your taxes? We'll go to jail. So we've got to do that. We're not going to vote. We're not going to pledge allegiance to the flag. We're not going to do a lot of things because man's government is inherently wicked. It may be wicked. Caesar's government was run by men who were wicked. But the principle of government, God makes it plain. It has its place within his economy of us being living on this earth as Christians. I think we see that in Romans the 13th chapter. When he speaks about the fact that you need to obey civil government. It is in place by the ordinance of God. If you withstand the government, you will withstand the ordinance of God. In verse 2. So you need to obey the laws. It's going to be a terror to evil. And it will praise the good. And by the way, pay them the taxes. Because we come all the way down to verse 5 and 7. He said, wherefore you must needs be in subjection not only because of the wrath. Hey, if I commit murder, they're going to come get me. 
and I'll pay a penalty for that. But for conscience sake, I'm, not, I'm going to obey them because I do not want to obey the ordinance of God. Not that he approves of that law, but it's a place of government to have its place in keeping order. And you do that for conscience sake because it's right. And for this cause, you pay tribute also. Did you read that? For this cause, you pay tribute also. I pay tribute not because they force me to. In a sense, I'll go to jail. I pay tribute because that's what he said. Also do that. For they are ministers of God's service, attending continually upon this very thing. Look at what two things go together in 1 Peter 2 and verse 17. Just right together in the scriptures and I'll be in, in our heart. When he says in verse 17, fear God, honor the king. Fear God, honor the king. You pay your taxes. You obey the laws of the land. What's the only time that we will come in conflict with civil government? Got an example in the Bible in Acts 5, 29, the apostles are being told that they're not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus, not to bring blood, accuse us of putting to death the Son of God and preaching his authority. You can't do that. And what did the apostle Peter and the apostles say? We must obey God rather than man. So there would be a time where are you, what are you going to do? You're going to obey the laws of the land or are you going to obey God? Because now we have a contradiction. problem on this occasion was that when government is doing its place, has its place, and it's upholding order and discipline, it can yield that sword, capital punishment. When it's doing those things, that it's not contradicting God and paying your taxes is not contradicting God. It works within that. The only time we must obey God rather than man. And there's when government begins to say you will not preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. You will not confess his name before men. Or death penalty or jail or what have you. We must obey God rather than man. But in the question here, it wasn't, we really want to know. They wanted to get him in a box, but God, but Jesus tells you of the relationship. So we need to understand their meaning, need to understand what the question is about, and understand, hey, I do have a relationship with my government. Whether you like the government or not, it's all right to pay your taxes. Secondly, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. So they come, and they come to Jesus on this occasion. And they begin to ask him. They, they build this story up to this, to, to this particular question. And they deal with the law where a brother whose brother died, he used to raise and had, didn't have children by his wife. He was to take that wife, raise children in honor of the name of his brother. And so they began to set for, here's the problem, Jesus. Wonder if this happened. That here was a, a woman, she had seven husbands and no children by them. In the resurrection, they finally get to it in Matthew 22, 28. In the resurrection, which they don't believe in, but in the resurrection. Therefore, whose wife shall she be of the seven, for they all had her. Work that one out, Jesus. We asked you a question. We should respond, what do you mean by that? How did Jesus, how are you going to answer that? They each were married to her. And Jesus exposed their ignorance of things and helps us to get to the understanding of things behind the question. We understand that they're just trying to make something so difficult that it will disprove the reality of the resurrection. These are little problems, these are big problems, therefore the resurrection does not exist. And the point is that didn't disprove the resurrection. So Jesus, what do you, how do you respond to that? And this is a powerful understanding that we get. He said, you err. 
Because we ask a question, we err. No, you err in the foundation of that question. And all the things that led up to it. You err not knowing the scriptures. You err not knowing the power of God. And from that two-point outline, Jesus teaches us something. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as angels in heaven. We're not going to need marriage like we have it here. So who is she going to belong to that you err? God's power is to make us in that glorified state in which we will not need marriage. You'll not be given in marriage. And I, I'm sure that will be happy for a lot of fathers, a lot, a lot of girls. Won't be damned to do that. In a resurrection, that's not going to be that way. And you're not going to need marriage. But are going to be as angels in heaven. So spiritual creatures. And the, the sexual relationship and all these things are going to change. Who, who brought that change? God has the power to do that. You, you, you err not knowing the power of God. To make us with bodies that we don't need that. Secondly, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? Read what? Scripture. Have you not read? That which he was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he said, have you not read that? I wrote the scroll of Exodus, the third chapter. Yeah, you read that. As God was speaking through the burning bush unto Moses. Take off your shoes on holy ground. It's in that context of who he was is the great I am. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's scripture. All right, let's, Jesus, how are, you, how are you applying that this day? I need to understand it. Got the question. You say there are not knowing this. I got the idea of marriage. So the question about who's going to be in the resurrection, uh, I got that. But now this scripture. What do you mean by that? Well, he, he's, he, he's going to help us understand it. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Many people I talk to say that means these guys are alive. That's not his point. His point is you die to be raised. That's the question. That's the nature of this thing. So in what sense could they still be dead? And God not be the God of the dead, but emphasis, living. And it would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now we look at back and say, those guys, those guys are dead. In Moses' day, they were dead. They've been dead for a long time. That was the impact. He's speaking to Moses with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob been dead a long time. And you're telling me that. He's not the God of the dead. Doesn't mean they don't die. His point's of resurrection. They're not going to be left in that dead state. He's the God of the living. Therefore, what? Come on, Jesus. Tell us. Jesus doesn't know. He doesn't tell us. Well, how can I understand? What are you driving at, Jesus? Look with me in Luke, the 20th chapter. I'll tell you what he's driving at. He's proving the resurrection. He's proving to us the resurrection. For in verse 33, In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of them shall he be? For the seven had her. And Jesus said that is unto them, The sons of this world marry. Sons of this world marry but are, and are given in marriage. But they that are accounted worthy to attain unto that world, and what is that? In the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. For neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are sons of God of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. In the place concerning the bush, when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus. Moses, you're showing the resurrection? How we want to interpret it is that he's showing they're still alive. They're dead. But they will be raised. And Moses showed it. 
Jesus, how can he show that? Why don't you just come out and tell me? I'm teaching you that. And what we find here to have the true understanding of why the question was asked and how Jesus responds to that is that we are inferring necessarily what Jesus necessarily implied. And that's how Moses showed it. Jesus adds this to it. God is not of the defeated God, of the, of the defeated by death. He's never defeated by death. But he's the God of the living. Therefore, these men will live again. And we gain that understanding from Scripture. Moses showed it from the power of God. In that glorified state, we will not need those fleshly satisfaction of our fleshly desires. It will be a total different existence. Where, did I, where can we learn that? It, we learned it from a question. Why was it given? to make it so difficult to disprove something. And it didn't do that at all. Well, Pharisees come back at him. And in Matthew 22 and verse 36, they asked this question to him, a teacher of the law. And we'll find in verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What's their motive on this occasion? You really want to understand what it is? Or, hey, we got 10 commandments, and if you put all the commandments in the Old Testament, you got 613. Well, they're truly, well, out of those 613, Jesus, which do you think is the greatest? I can see curious people asking that. But the Bible says, here's the motive. They were trying him. They were testing him. Testing him to see if he got the right answer. Who's going to tell you which is the right answer? No, we're testing him. We got all these commandments. You pick the one that's the greatest. Just to bring a dilemma up. Were they seeking the truth that's in that question? I don't think so. They were testing, trying. These were captious questions. Put him on a spot. And Jesus used them. And by these questions, we can understand some things. And what we begin to understand is how Jesus responded. That in reality, all the commandments, 10, 613, you can put them all into two categories. But there is a great commandment. And everything else falls in connection with it, not contradictory to it. And so Jesus says in verses 38 through 40, this is the great and first commandment. He just adds to it, it's not only the great, but it is primarily number one. It is the priority. The great and first commandment, and it says there's a second one like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, what's that first and great commandment? Thou love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind this is the great and first commandment you love with all you got deuteronomy 6 tells us the reason we can is because god is one we don't have to divide to meet 20 many gods god is a plural one the word denotes that that idea that there's the father and the son the holy spirit but god is one and therefore we love him with all that we have. That's the point that we see there. And we're to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind. The place is the strength. What about our neighbor as ourselves? Leviticus 19, 18. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. And so there is that relationship with God and with man. He didn't say, by the way, loving your neighbor as yourself is the great commandment too. He said, no, the second one is like unto it. And so we hear the question, what's the great commandment? We come away with understanding that our relationship with God and our relationship with fellow man, that about covers it. 
hinges upon the great commandment of loving him with all that I've got, my mind and strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. Will, will that cover a few commandments? Paul says so. In Romans the 13th chapter, in verses 9 and 10, Owe no man anything, say to love one another. For he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. Which is the great commandment? Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't covet. And if there be any other commandment is summed up in the word namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I got four commandments that are covered by loving my neighbor by myself, as myself. That's what he means. It hangs on these two. And so he didn't have to pick one of the 613. He had to pick one of the Ten, uh, uh, ten Commandments. But it was the nature of God. And we see the nature of God bringing forth his commandments. Relationship with me. And right connected with that is my relation, your relationship with fellow man. And all these laws are, are hanging on those two. And what we come away with, it's all about love. <laughs> loving God with all that I have and loving my neighbor as myself. And all these commandments work through that. So in the question that was trying to test Jesus, come up with one and then you'll, you'll look bad on the others. He brings them all together. And that's where we get understanding. That's where we realize that here, these two principal things, these are what these commandments are all about. They're working from those strong first and second commandments that God gives us. And we, we begin to understand that. Now, Jesus asked a question. And he says in verse 42, I got a question for you. What think ye of Christ? And in particular, whose son is he? Jesus, you don't know? Are you asking this question because you honestly want to know an answer? Yeah, he honestly wants to know an answer. But it means more than the question. God is always asking questions to teach us something about ourselves. And they respond. I tell you, who Christ is, the Messiah, he's the son of David. And Jesus comes back with another question. He's not through because he's driving them to a conclusion. How then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Now notice that question. You got him being the son of David? Jesus doesn't contradict that. So you're wrong here and let's go here. He said then how come David not from his own guidance but in the spirit calls him Lord where does he do that Psalm 110 verse 1 David writes the Lord as God said unto my Lord David calls the one who's going to sit on the right hand of the first Lord he calls him Lord And that's Jesus' second question. How come he says that sit thou on my right hand till I put the enemies under thy feet? We know that's dealing with Messiah. You read the book of Hebrews and you'll realize that Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 go together. My son, this day have I begotten thee and you will be a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4. It's all in the context of this passage. And indeed... David, guided by the Spirit, called him Lord. How are you going to answer that? How would, they, how would they do that? As we see in Matthew 22. How do they respond to that? Because they are the ones that are answering the questions. And then Jesus, Jesus doesn't leave them there. 
He says, if David calleth him Lord, how is he his son? Verse 45. Jesus, are you just being mean? Are you wicked? And that's asking the question like you said that the Pharisees were. Well, his motives are pure. He's teaching us something. And what we see here is that David is calling the Messiah as Lord. And they said, no, he's his son. Son, Lord. That's relationship. How could that be? And ladies and gentlemen, son of David, son of God, David's Lord are all true. They didn't give a wrong answer. But Jesus keeps asking questions to drive them into a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. And if there were ever a passage that I think sums up real well for us who Jesus is in these, this dual role, it's Romans the first chapter in verse 3 and 4. When he speaks about the gospel and what has been promised, he says, concerning his son, concerning God's son, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. He is the son of David according to the flesh. Who was declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. The son of God of power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. There is his relationship with God. Why could David call his son Lord? It's because his son would come, as far as the flesh is concerned, of his lineage. But oh, who was coming that day? It was the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. It was the Word that was eternal and with God and was God and continues to be God. But the word became flesh in John 1, 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten. That's what's issuing. God didn't have sex with somebody. It issues from the one God, the Son, who eternally has been begotten. And there were times he wasn't begotten. And he's come forth from him, and he's the Lord. He's David's Lord. In the flesh, he's David's son. They all go together. Jesus, why did you ask that question? Because I want you to understand that. That's why I ask. And they walked away and they didn't answer, ask him any more questions. Tonight, what do we learn from questions and answers? They can be given with wicked motives. They really don't know, want to know the answer. And we don't have the infallible perception that God does or Jesus did to know where they're coming from. But a lot of times you can pick up on all the surroundings what this is all about. And you answer accordingly. But what did we learn tonight? You think about just that one passage, one scripture, one chapter. I learned my proper relationship with civil government. that I will pay them tribute. That's got their money, their faces on that money. That's what goes, I'll give to them. And that's part of my serving God. God's made it plain. The only time I'll ever contradict civil government is when it's demanding to me something that God demands and they contradict, that God condemns. Or God demands and they condemn it for me to do it. That's when we'll draw the line. God's clear on that. It starts with a question. I understand that. Also understand about eternity. Understand the resurrection from the dead. Understand something about heaven. I, I can't grasp it. We're living in the flesh. We have our desires of the flesh. Don't understand all the ramifications, but we're going to have a spiritual body, a glorified body. We won't need these things. I won't need to be eating all the time. You know, I'm hungry. The sexual relationship, 
All those things that we are, are part of life, and they're a very good part of life. We won't need that. It's hard to grasp existence like that, but it'll happen. But did you listen when I said from Luke 20 that Jesus adds there, we cannot die? It didn't say you may not die. He said you cannot die. Where did death come from? It come from a sinning. We're going to be sons of God of the resurrection. And we'll be in a place, we'll be in a situation. We know from Revelation, no unrighteousness will enter into that gate. There'll never be again that possibility of a sinning, of transgressing God's law. We'll be in that glorified state where we cannot die. And a question allowed me to get a hold of that. And Jesus teaches us that. And we learn also Jesus, the identity of Jesus. He was in the flesh, but he was God in the flesh. And when my Jehovah's Witnesses come around, and they deny that Jesus is God, but he's a God. Down the road from the true God, Jehovah. They don't understand my Lord. And I learned that in the question. Where indeed he is Lord of David and he's also David's son. Got the flesh part but got the incarnation. You've got God living in the flesh. And a complicated thing but we know that from the scripture. And the final thing that I want us to think about from God's dealing with man in Genesis. And we'll offer the invitation on this that God knows where you are. He said, where art thou? God knows where you are. But one day, this earth is going to be burned up in 2 Peter 3. And the works of man are going to be gone. Everything's going to be dissolved with fervent heat. Dissolved means the various atoms are going to separate. They're not going to be held together by Jesus' word. and allow them to go. It's not refurbishing this world. This world is going to go apart. All the elements are part of it. Fervent heat, it's all going to happen. And therefore, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living? In all the manner of holy living? Peter asked that question. And in that context of knowing that we will look forward to a new heaven, new earth. Not a refurbished one here. With a bunch of animals that are... Uh, love each other and we're just living like Adam and Eve again as you see in the watchtower but new heavens new earth where dwelleth righteousness where I don't need to eat the sexual relationship it's a total existence but there there is idea of new heavens new earth this is where we have a concept of I'll have a place but it's a picture of heaven and he says in verse 14, knowing that these things are all to come about, give diligence that you will be found in peace without spot, blameless in his sight. God asks you, where art thou? He knows where you are. What do you need to understand? It's not that I, I want to know where my place is. I want to know my relationship with God. I want to be found. You will be found. In peace with him. Without spot. Blameless. In whose sight? God, don't you know where I am? You ask, where art thou? It's all about relationship. Blameless in his sight. I want to be found that way. Now, if I've never become a Christian yet. You're not at peace with God. You have no hope. You're without Christ in this world. But you can come to him by the, obeying the gospel. And he can baptize you into Christ. You express your faith in who he is. And you could become a child of God. And you could be blameless in his sight. But dear Christian, don't you remember the first man and woman? That God could ask you that question. If he ever asked you that question, if that ever comes up in the judgment, where art thou? You will know it wasn't about he didn't know where I was because I'm here and he's looking at me. He would say, what relationship are you living with me now? 
Peter was not writing to alien sinners when he said that. He's writing to Christians. And I want to implore you, if you're not living right as a Christian, you're not blameless in his sight, then you don't want the judgment to come and unprepared. You want to be found in peace with him without spot, blameless in his sight. So if you need to make things right, we're here to assist you. Come as we stand and as we sing.